be able to introduce our guest speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Alan Marinas. And uh, by way of introduction, I prepared a few words. So over seven years ago, <clears throat> on uh, July 22nd, 2009, I wrote to Dr. Alan Marinas, the author of the book Climbing Jacob's Ladder, and uh, I was uh, very moved by, by reading that book, and I was deeply inspired by Alan's story and his message, and in particular what really hit home was his respect for the hidden treasure of the Jewish tradition, Musar, and his reverence in particular for its great teachers and practitioners. That very same day, after writing to Alan, Alan wrote back to me, and it was a very thoughtful and timely note filled with compassion, vulnerability, and tender understanding. <clears throat> I knew then that this author walked the talk. A man of solid character, a true teacher, a student of Musar, a mensch. A key phrase in Alan's reply to me by email was the following, quote, the Jewish world we grew up in didn't make it easy to either find the pathways or to feel the beautiful essence of this wise tradition. That really hit home for me. Where was this incredible tradition? These words resonated to my core and continue to do so today. In fact, many of Alan's words have had a similar effect. Dr. Alan Marinus is the author of four books focused on Musar, one of which I read immediately as I finished the first book, Everyday Holiness, and a real life changer for many people. <clears throat> he uh, also is the founder and the dean of the Musar Institute, and regularly offers lectures and workshops around the world. Alan studied at Oxford University on a Rhodes Scholarship and has dedicated the past 16 years of his life to reviving the nearly lost Jewish spiritual discipline of Musar. I can only imagine that everyone who learns about and practices Musar experiences its profound wisdom and value in uniquely individual and different ways. For me, Musar was transformational not only in the benefit I received around improving vital aspects of my character and soul, but also in the inspiration it provided to elevate my Jewish soul. Such is the power and potential of Musar. And I might add, a power that is chaperoned into the 21st century with clarity, eloquence, and reverence that Alan provides in his insightful and approachable writings and teachings. As an executive coach for the past 14 years and as a professional development instructor at the UBC Sauter School of Business for the last five, I have been deeply immersed in the world of personal growth and development, including countless theories and authors on the subject. Indeed, many are good, very good, and very useful, but to me, Musar proceeds and surpasses them all. Withstanding the test of time and unimaginable circumstances, large and small, over the centuries. Moreover, it offers something that other more contemporary sources do not. True Jewish context, true Jewish content, and Jewish soul. Though it has the potential to speak to both Jews and non-Jews alike, there is something precious about its direct and indistinguishable, indistinguishable blending of Torah wisdom with everyday challenges and opportunities that help us elevate our soul and better engage with life. In reviving Musar for the masses beyond just the walls of the yeshivas around the world, the world already owes Alan a considerable debt of gratitude for the courage, fortitude, and humility he has unleashed in service of God, in service of the great rabbis and students who preceded us, in service of the Jews 
and non-Jews who surround us and in service of the future generations who await us. This evening, as we continue our inner journey of reflection and contemplation in the month of Elul, we are very fortunate indeed to learn from Vancouver's very own Dr. Alan Marinus, a true treasure in the Jewish world, and to learn about Musar, a true treasure of the Jewish tradition. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alan Marinus. My thought was, can we hear that again? <laughs> I did tape it. So. Okay. No, that was a beautiful introduction, and I, um, I'm, I'm grateful to you, Jeff. I'm grateful to you, Rabbi Dan, and grateful to everyone who came to hear a bit about this great treasure that Jeff is referring to, the treasure of the Musar tradition. And um, next week, I'm going to New York to attend a series of meetings being put on by the Lipman Camphor Foundation, and. They ask a very strange question as part of their preparation. They say, in your teaching, what is the thing you're most proud of? And, and I have a stock answer for that, because I think the thing I am most proud of in teaching Musar is that none of it is mine. It's not my teaching. I feel very strongly that one of the great gifts of this tradition is the fact that it is a tradition. And so <laughs> we don't need that. And so the fact that we have this heritage that has come down essentially through 1,100 years of Jewish history, dating back to the 10th century, that's the treasure. And the fact that we may not know about it, most people who grew up in the Jewish world did not get any exposure to anything of the Musar tradition in growing up in Hebrew school or Sunday school. And in most cases, in rabbinical seminary. Most people who became rabbis in the non-Orthodox world would not have been exposed to the Musar tradition. So that's a pretty remarkable thing. It reflects a larger phenomenon. I want to talk about it a bit because where I, what I really want to talk about is to deal with the fact that we're on the cusp of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We're in the month of Elul when the work of Teshuva and self-restoration and sort of cleansing is already upon us. And there's a connection between sort of the broader context of explaining how it came about that this old and venerable and quite broad tradition was unknown. And then I want to connect that to our own journey into the high holy days that are coming. Musar has always been known and it always has existed, at least since the 10th century. But Jews who grew up in the non-Orthodox world in the post-Second World War period were not exposed to it. And what I think that reflects in large part is the fact that the inner life of the individual was really not on the Jewish agenda in that period. The Jewish world was concerned with many things, but the inner life of the individual, which I would say in a Jewish way is to talk about the journey of the soul, was really not the focus of synagogue and temple life at all. The community was very concerned with building community and with having collective activities. So you end up with a Jewish world, which is still with us, where the entire emphasis falls on the collective, or on the collective participation. And if you are concerned with the inner life of the individual, that has no organized context in the Jewish world. For that, you have psychiatrists and psychologists, right? And it's interesting that the pathways of Jewish spirituality, of exploring the inner life in a Jewish way, were not open in that period. When I look around, I see most of us grew into adulthood in that time. We were not given access to the Jewish pathways for spiritual exploration and growth. And how many Jews did become psychologists and psychiatrists? Maybe there's a connection there. And how many of those psychiatrists and psychologists' clients are Jews? Now, there we're talking about a significant population. Because Jews have always been spiritual seekers. I mean, since the time of Abraham, you look at the story of Avraham Avinu and Lech Lecha. You know, go. And we have been goers. We have been people who have been seekers. 
And in the Jewish world that we grew up in, those pathways were not made available to us. And I sort of, you know, on the one hand, I think about the, the sensitivity and the importance of recognizing the soul journey, which I'll talk about a bit more later, and on the other hand, responsive reading. Like to me, responsive reading represents the kind of collectivization of performance that really does not account or, or structure anything for the journey of the individual. And really it is the journey of the individual that is the focus of this time of year, when we are really brought time and again it's such a, again, it's one of the great gifts of the tradition that we come around to the cycle of introspection and self-awareness and a commitment to change. We're brought around to that again. It's really about you as an individual. Judaism is very big on the notion of taking responsibility, of being responsible for the words you say, for the deeds you do, for how you treat other people, how you treat yourself. That requires a kind of inner self-awareness, but it's all focused on the individual. No one can do tshuva for you. You know, if you're familiar with the word tshuva, the idea of, it's sometimes repentance, but the word more literally means to return. And there is a notion within the Jewish world that as the cycle of the year goes by and as life goes by, we lose the track. And then around comes the cycle again to remind us to return to come back to the track, come back on our path, because likely we've lost our way. No one can do tshuva for you. you know, as, what I like to say is there's no hitchhiking on the spiritual path. You have to walk it yourself. And that guidelines for the individual on this individual spiritual journey are largely invisible. And what you get instead is a 700-page machsor. And it's hard sometimes to see within all the constructs of the Jewish world that Judaism has always wanted us to undertake a Jewish spiritual journey, the individual spiritual journey. The origins of the Musar tradition go back, as I said, to the 900s, but the source piece that really initiated the tradition was a verse from the Torah, and that verse really sets the uh, agenda and the mission of a human being and make sense of this idea of an individual journey. And that's the verse in Leviticus that says, Kedoshim Tihiyu, that you shall be holy. And that Torah says it in so many different ways, that the purpose of a human life and the goal that we, are, we have set for us is that we should be holy. And when it says Kedoshim Tihiyu, or in other places, Anshe Kodesh Tihiyun Li, the Torah says it many different ways. Almost exclusively, it says it in the plural. And Kedoshim is the plural of Kadosh. Kadosh is holy, Kedoshim is the plural. Because it is only as a collection of individuals, individuals pursuing their own holiness. That's the vision that the Torah has for us as Jews and within the Jewish world for a life. Not to accomplish anything necessarily in, the, in worldly endeavor or any other measure you might bring to a life. The Torah is absolutely explicit that the spiritual purification of the individual is the ultimate goal of a human life. Kedoshim tihiyu, you shall be holy. And holiness, we could talk a lot about that. I'll not talk so long that there won't be time for questions, so maybe you'll want to return me to the subject. But holiness, however you might want to define it, is a spiritual quality. And Jeff was mentioning, sort of comparing Musar to other sort of self-help or self-development disciplines and so on. One of the strengths of a Jewish view drawing from the Torah is that what gets included in it is spiritual values. Now, I think that's starting to penetrate into the secular, so-called secular, once you get spiritual values. I'm not sure it counts as secular anymore, but, but Judaism is absolutely explicit, and it would be very hard in a context of psychology or coaching or self-help to bring up a notion like holiness, kedusha as being the goal that we're working towards. In a Jewish context, it's absolutely comfortable because the Torah sources are so clear, it is so fundamental to the view of our lives that the tradition and the Torah provide to us that it's almost obligatory to 
look at that subject and recognize that in many ways, most of us are very unfamiliar with the world of the soul, the journey of the soul, the goal of holiness. Where did we learn about this? And I said, because in the second half of the 20th century, where the inner life of the individual was not on the Jewish agenda, all of this, which is actually central to Judaism, I mean, if you can find many verses in the Torah, you're ent entitled to say, this is central to Judaism, if it's coming directly out of the Torah. And so we weren't exposed to it. And so we go into life, and especially this time of year, going into Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we go in a way most of us are kind of ill-equipped. When I took my own quite long and extensive journey into exploring the Musa tradition, I eventually had the very good fortune to find a teacher for myself. For the first uh, two years, I simply read old Musar books. That was my introduction to the tradition. I'd, I'd heard, or I'd read, I'd stumbled over a reference in a book that there was this tradition that focused on the life of the individual, recognizing that we're, we're all individuals, we're all unique. Where in the Jewish world is the guidance for the unique person you are? That's what I was looking for. I was looking for my own personal guidance. And I eventually had the good fortune to find a teacher, Rabbi Yechiel Yitzchak Peer, who is uh, still the Rosh Hashiva of the Yeshiva of Far Rockaway in New York. And there are many stories about my encounter with Rabbi Peer. But after studying with him for the better part of two years, he said to me, you know, if I had you to do over, those were his words, if I had you to do over, he said, I'd start with the soul. I didn't realize how little you understood. And, you know, in all humility, I recognize it's true, but it's not a particularly devastating thing to admit because I look at my own background as a kind of typical sort of... Jewish in identity, but not very involved in the uh, organized Jewish world growing up, where would I have learned about the soul? Where, would I, where was the context that someone took me and said, this is very important? Because from a Jewish point of view, this is the essence of who you are. The other stuff, the identity, the worldly accomplishments, the thought processes and so on, those are all the transient and more superficial aspects of a human being. From a Jewish point of view, the essence of the human being is a neshama, the soul. And I want to explore that a little bit because when we talk about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the opportunity presented to us by Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur increases many fold when we come to a better understanding of ourselves as being on a soul journey. Because then, this idea of being on a track, it's assumed we'll lose our way, or we aren't as centered on the track, and then using this season to return to our central purpose, to make amends for the things that we've done, that we look back and say, I shouldn't have done that, that was not up to the standard, and to commit to being a person who lives to a higher standard because our goal is holiness. It's a very unrelenting kind of goal. It's a very high bar. And so we have the gift of this season which increases in significance in direct proportion to how much you understand of life as a soul. You know, the truth is we live life as if we're kind of, we're like players in a play. I think Shakespeare got there before I did. But the, we're players in a play, and we don't step back to look at the whole proscenium. We don't see the whole, we don't want to see the whole, the whole that we're participating in. But when you think about the very fact of mortality, both in terms of being born, and coming into the world and developing as a human being, and then aging, as we all do all too quickly if we're fortunate enough, 
and then dying, there's a tremendous mystery afoot. Now, we, we play it down, like we bring down the perspective to be just moving the pieces around. Like, who, I talk in the US law, who are you gonna vote for? Or, you know, what do you think about the court case that's going on about Medicare? And, you know, we, we get caught in the bits and pieces. You know, I had a piece of furniture being installed in my house today. So the real focus, like the intensity, all the consciousness is on fitting this wall unit into the family room, and that's like the main focus of the day. But, but Judaism wants us to return, to come to this larger perspective of saying, made in the image and likeness of God. Each of us is made in the image and likeness of God. That's an amazing thought to carry around on a daily basis and to recognize that, as the Musser teachers taught it, that spiritual essence is, is within each of us as the neshama. Now, I'm going to explore with you a little bit the anatomy of the soul, and then I'll use that to focus in more on the work of this holy season. The neshama is the holy essence of a person. It says in, in the book of Proverbs, it says, Ner Hashem nishmat adam, that the Nishama of a human being, Adam, Ner Hashem, the candle of God. The human soul is the candle of God. And that within us, there burns that holy light. And when we return to the notion of holiness, that verse that I quoted, Kedoshim Tihyu, that's actually only half the verse. The whole verse says, Kedoshim Tihyu ki Kadosh ani Adunai Elohecha. That you shall be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, we're made in the image and likeness of God. The verse tells us God's holy. It says we're supposed to be holy. There's a very strong pointer to the spiritual essence that is the most important, the core of what a human being is. It's the Jewish focus is on that spiritual, that divine spiritual essence, which is innate in each of us. That's the inborn quality. Most of us do not have that concept. We don't have that concept of other people, and we certainly don't have that concept of ourselves. To get up in the morning as a holy soul, go through the day in a neshama frame of mind, and go to sleep at night, the body being tired, and giving rest so that the neshama can have, can resume the journey tomorrow because the neshama's on a journey. And that concept, that awareness, that neshama awareness is so deep and central in Jewish thought and practice. And yet, most of us were not exposed to that. So it's very important. And that's what my teacher meant when he said, if I had you to do over, I would focus on the soul, because it's that awareness. Now, in the traditional liturgy, every morning in the Shachri prayers, it says, Elohai nishama shenatata bi tahorahi. Elohai, my God, nishama, the nishama, that you put in me is pure. Every morning, we affirm a pure core that we are within us, and it's not in this case, in that prayer, it's not saying you should have, or you will have, or you used to have. It's, a, it's in the present tense. And it brings it as a kind of meditation, or a visualization, or an awareness practice to say, and I think this is why it's in the liturgy daily. You know, if we got the concept, we wouldn't have to be reminded day after day after day. But the liturgy is structured in the Siddur to remind us, to bring it back to us, to say, you are a holy soul. That's who we are. That's the Jewish view of what a human being is. That actually explains a lot of Jewish law. Things that need to be done or can't be done or where people are, you know, just for example, someone who is completely incapacitated, somebody who has, let's imagine the extreme case, they have no arms, they have no legs, 
They have no consciousness. The brain is at whatever the lowest level of brain function possible to be living. The heart is, is still pumping, but you know, somebody who is really not functional and not conscious and not sentient, that person is entitled to all the protections of Jewish law because the essence of what a person is is not in the body and it's not in the thoughts and it's not in the feelings. It's in the spiritual candle that burns at the center of that soul. That's the essence of a human being from a Jewish point of view. We live in such a secular, such a materialistic, such a uh, technological society. It feels like it feels like I'm speaking almost a different language, you know? I know it's English, most of it, but it is almost like a different language from everyday consciousness. And yet it is the traditional Jewish language. It is the mirror that's held up to us to say, this is who you are, take a look. And coming down to us through the centuries, because when I quote the book of Proverbs, we're back in the Torah. And then certainly in subsequent sources as well. The tricky piece is that that's not all who you are. You're not just a neshama. And the Musr teachers have recognized, and again, drawing from deeper sources, that there, there are other dimensions of soul life that are also present within us. You know, because I think you may have the same experience as I do. You, you can walk out down Oak Street and you don't necessarily see everybody sort of manifesting this holy candle of God in their everyday you know, way of being. Certainly if you drive down Oak Street, you don't see it, you know. Uh, because there are other dimensions of the inner life that play a role here. And just to be concise, the Muslim teachers talk about two other dimensions of the soul. The Ruach, which is the spirit, which is really the animating force within, and then the Nefesh, which is the sort of more worldly aspect of the soul. And Human beings are not the only creatures to have a nefesh. All animals have nefeshot. So a dog has a nefesh, but a dog does not have a neshama. So this is a lower level of soul, which includes all the inner experiences, which are called spiritual because they're intangible. Emotions, thoughts, capacities, values, all, from a Jewish point of view, that's all spiritual. Everything that goes on in the inner life that is not material-based, it's not concrete, that's part of the spiritual realm. And what the Muslim teachers really focused on was that if it's true, and this certainly is asserted as true, that this is our, our holy essence, the neshama is untainted and radiant and brilliant within us all the time as an innate gift of being a human being, the work of spiritual elevation, of becoming holy, isn't a matter of gaining holiness, because you've already got a holy soul. You are by birth a neshama, candle of God. The work is actually to clear the obstacles out of the way. And they developed a lot of understanding of what those obstacles are. It's not about you know, I often use the example, like, there's no holiness filling station. You can't, there's nowhere to go and, like, you put your finger in and you get filled up with holiness. You're already filled with holiness. The problem is, the challenge in human life is that that inherent gift of radiance exists within an atmosphere which can take on different qualities. The Muslim teachers focus particularly on the nefesh and what they did and they developed, and you go back and look at the Musser literature, and you find in the 11th century and the 12th century, the 13th century, right up until my own book, Everyday Holiness, the core focus, including in my book, is the qualities of the nefesh soul. So in the, in the central part of my book, there's 18 chapters on 18 different individual inner traits, all of which you'll be ex familiar with in one way or another. In other words, if I say generosity or humility or truth or uh, laziness or its counterpart enthusiasm and whatever, this is all very familiar to you. This is, this is common English language. 
What's not so familiar is the Jewish definitions of each of those qualities. Uh, when you recognize that the Torah says that Moses is known or is, is called the most humble man on the face of the earth, the most humble person on the face of the earth, you look at Moses, you say, okay, I don't, know, I don't understand what humility is now. If that's the most humble person is Moses who like, you know, walks in and demands that the Pharaoh let the people go and leads the people out and speaks directly with God. It's, there are Jewish understandings of each of the aspects of the inner life, which we're largely not familiar with because no one has, there's been no context for understanding uh, or being taught the Jewish views of all of our inner qualities where um, envy can be seen through a Jewish lens, anger, seen through a Jewish lens, and understood in that context. The, the Musser teacher studied this and wrote about this for about 900 years. I'll repeat that. The Musser teacher studied this and wrote about it for 900 years, really examining the qualities of the inner life. I mentioned to Rabbi Moskowitz that we're taking a Musser tour to Israel in uh, in February, and we're going to go to Tzfat, and one of the focuses in Tzfat is the Abu Hab Shul. Some of you may have been to Tzfat, or you may have been to the Abu Hab Shul. It's a beautiful old little shul. Rabbi Yitzhak Abu Hab, in the 15th century, wrote a book on envy. The whole book is on envy. Because there was an understanding, there needed to be an understanding, and envy is understood so interestingly in the, in the Jewish field. The word is kina, but it's also applied to God, and you see, it's like you have a jealous God, but sometimes it's, that's understood as zealous. And then it says in the Talmud, kinat sofrim tarbe chokhmah, the kina of the sages increases wisdom. Like, it's being praised. Envy is being praised as having a quality to increase wisdom. So all of these it took 900 years, and there are many compendia helping us to understand our own inner traits. But the real uh, paradigm that they developed was this. The focus of Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, should be on the traits of your inner life that are some way, in some way contributing to the issues that you're creating in your life and in other people's lives. You know, many people get into trouble because they don't tell the truth. That is one of the qualities of the nefesh soul. Some people get into trouble because they tell the truth too brutally and feel justified in it. Not everybody's ready to hear the truth or it's not necessarily the right context. There's different ways. And just because it's true doesn't give you the license to say it. Some people are too truthful in a sense. And so it is with all the inner traits. They tend to be the things that play two key roles in our lives. One is accessible to us. One is the one that I already introduced. One is that these are the things we trip over. These are the things that get us into trouble. These are the things that make life painful for ourselves and others. The people who are continually late. The people who are continually impatient. And I stress the word continually or extremely because the Musser teachers taught us there's nothing wrong with the traits themselves. I already told you, envy is praised. But in the Christian context, envy is one of the deadly sins. In the Jewish context, they say, no, envy has a positive role. And even the ones that we would see as positive can have a negative role. There's such a thing as too much patience. There's such a thing as too much generosity inappropriate generosity. So the Musser teachers said this. They said the traits are, we all have all the traits. Everybody has the full set. Everybody in this room has been angry. Everybody in this room has told a lie. Everybody has been kind. Everybody has done something cruel and hard-hearted. Everybody. They recognize that. That's who we are. We all have all the traits. Where the focus comes down in our spiritual lives and in the journey of the soul is on the traits which are tending towards the extreme 
in one way or another, in one direction or another. If you take the example of humility, there is such a thing as positive humility, which is obviously, if, it, if that is attached to Moses, we call that positive, but you can push it out so much further than that, in which you have absolutely no self-respect, you have no self-esteem, you have complete self you know, disregard. That's taking humility so far as to say, you know, like, I'm a worm, I'm a nothing, I'm a way out there, which Moses never said. And on the other side, you do have self-esteem, you have pride, which again, the Talmud pri praises. The Talmud says it's a, a degree of pride is necessary. But then if you push it out to arrogance, you're at the other extreme. So this complete disregard of one's own worth or the complete exaggeration of one's worth, these extremes of the traits drop what Rambam calls a veil over the light of the neshama. There's nothing to gain. There's no holiness to acquire. It's to become aware. You can see where this ties into Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. At least I can see where it is. And maybe I'll make that explicit in a minute. To be aware of which traits in me do I tend to go to this extreme or alternatively to this extreme in a kind of patterned way? It's not contextual. It's not that Okay, in this, in this case, this individual is not even driving the speed limit. I have a right to be impatient. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the person who finds long lineups and slow drivers everywhere. It doesn't matter. You know, the person's only going 10 kilometers over the speed limit. I'm impatient. You know, or there's two people in front of me at the Starbucks, and one of them is ordering... I can't even imitate what the order is. It's like a half fat, no foam, half calf, you know, latte macchiato. You know, it's like, I don't know what language they're talking. It's like, and the person. Pull out their wallet and pay with individual tips. Right. <laughs> or they can't find their wallet, you know, or. The one who gets me, and I may have mentioned this if you've heard me speak before, because it's a pet peeve of mine, is the person who has everything that's valuable in their life with a rubber band around it. You know, and it's somewhere. I know I've got that one, and then they get it, and then they start like, take off the rubber band, start, and there's like everything is in that, and they never find the credit card on the first pass through, never. It's some sort of divine law. Anyway, the focus that the Musser teachers brought to the Jewish spiritual journey is to say, the first step is to become aware of which traits of the nefesh soul in you are tending towards one extreme or another. And it's true for all of us. The way they express it, my interpretation of that is that each of us has a curriculum. We're supposed to grow in life. We're supposed to transform. In that sense, we have to have potential. That potential shows up by the person who is lazy or the person who is so restless they know no rest, or the person who is arrogant, or the person who is self-denigrating, or the person who is, doesn't know truth from falsehood, they're so disconnected from the, the quality of truth, and the person who is brutally truthful, and so on through all the traits. And you find books in all those previous centuries where people are focusing on each one of the inner traits. Worry. That's one that they focus on. Because worry has a value. Worry in the sense of care and concern and attention to detail. And then double checking. That's good. But like the kind of, this kind of worry where it's like all just burning smoke and nothing. That's not. That's, that is a middah. That's the Hebrew for a trait of character at the extreme. And then the person who is so... Um, careless, they are so lackadaisical, they are so unconcerned. That's the other extreme. And from a Musser point of view, each of them, doesn't matter which extreme you're on, each of them can be a veil. And that veil blocks the light of holiness. And the work is to realize which traits you are, it's true for you. It, you have to come to a realization. What is true for me? Am I arrogant? You know, am I not? I, 
probably have told the story here, but um, how I learned that humility was one of the traits that I was challenged in, because uh, it was a situation much like this, and I've written about it, so if you've read it, excuse me for telling it again, but it's very illustrative. Life wants to tell you, if you will pay attention, which traits are on your curriculum. I'd given a talk quite like this, and then after, and it was in Vancouver, which is relevant to the story. And then I had finished my talk, and afterwards a woman came up and introduced herself to me, and she said, you have a wonderful, wonderful, <laughs> and John knows the punchline. Um, the, in that time that she said, wonderful, wonderful, I came up with three possibilities of where this sentence was going because I had just given a talk. So I thought she was going to say, you have a wonderful, wonderful voice. Sometimes people compliment, compliment me on my voice, but more commonly people will com compliment me on the fact that I can give an entire well-structured talk with no notes and seldom losing my place. I don't, I used to be able to say never using my place, losing my place, now I have to say seldom losing my place not saying um, speaking in whole sentences. So I thought she was gonna say, you have a wonderful, wonderful way with words. But I actually thought I'd given a very good talk. I thought I'd really you know, been in a very strong presence and given a very good message. And so I, in my ultimate theorizing, I said, she's gonna say, you have a wonderful, wonderful presence. And then she finished what she actually was going to say. She said, you have a wonderful, wonderful wife. <laughs> and I do. But I wasn't thinking of her. I was thinking of me. This is all about me. I was, I was the big player. This must all be about me. If someone's talking to me, it must be about me. And that's the way in which, if you pay attention to your life situation, you'll see being reflected back to you exactly the image of which traits you have to one extreme or another, and you have them. And if you can't name them now, you have some work to do. And that's the work of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. That's the work of becoming aware of where you are bringing into the world a quality which is the counterpart of holiness, the obstacle to holiness. And that is how we understand. That's what the Muslim teachers say. It exists within you. Rambam, Maimonides, says, you know, when you do tshuva for Rosh Hashanah, I'm not quoting him here, I'm paraphrasing him. He says, it's not just on your deeds and your words. It's also on your inner qualities. It's on the feelings that you have towards other people, towards the world, towards yourself. All the inner traits are also the focus of teshuva. And and that makes sense because the words and the behavior for which there's a lot of talk in the preparation for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur about making amends, saying your story, asking forgiveness, even this workshop that's coming up with the, uh, the, the uh, retired judge about forgiveness, very much about the external and about the doing and in the world, but where does that come from? Where do the harsh words come from? Where does the, the transgressive behavior, which traditionally in Judaism we would have called sins, where does that all come from? It comes from the qualities of the inner life. If it's just an accident, you're actually not held responsible. You know, we just had the Torah portion last week about the cities of refuge. If you kill someone, well, if it was an accident, you'll be protected by society you're not considered to be subject to the other kinds of retribution that do apply if it was a deliberate murder. But there's an, the, the example in the Torah is you're chopping wood and the, and the, handle of the uh, head of the ax flies off and kills somebody. You'll be protected by society. You can go to one of the cities of refuge. And so th there's a recognition that if it's deliberate, if you, the things you are held responsible for, are the actions which come out of the inner life that you cultivate day in and day out just because you're making choices. And if you hold, as our tradition wants you to hold, a notion of holiness as being your goal, you might make different choices. You might use that as a touchstone to say, 
I'm going to do something now. Is it in the direction of holiness? I'm going to say something now. Is it in the direction of holiness? And you know, the, the word musar in modern Hebrew is translated as ethics. It is the modern Hebrew word for ethics. The Musar teachers did not see Musar as an ethical discipline. They saw that the path of working on yourself to pull that arrogance back so it's just more moderate as self-esteem or to build up that self-esteem so you're not so self-denigrating, that isn't meant to be self-improvement. What it is is, is a step towards on the journey towards the goal of holiness. That that's really what that's about. Those are the obstacles. So one of the Muslim teachers of the 19th century, he said, don't be better. He said, be higher. The essence is not, th the goal is not ethics. The means is everyday behavior, everyday values, everyday thoughts and feelings within ourselves. So the Muslim discipline really focuses on awareness of which traits and the setting of those traits. The word in Hebrew, and I mentioned it, I think, briefly, the word for those inner traits or character traits in Hebrew is midah. The plural is midot. And that word literally means measure. The, the verb in modern Hebrew for measurement is limdod, from the same root. Because the issue that our teachers bring to us is not which traits you have, we all have all of them. But the measure of those traits becomes the source of goodness or evil in the world as we manifest that. And the goal is very clear. The goal is to be a beacon of holiness. And for that, the work, and especially the work that we're brought back to year after year, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, is not just to say sorry, and not just to ask for forgiveness, but to look at that behavior and say, which trait in me underlies that? Because if that's the behavior I've brought into the world, I may have some work to do. Because the biggest failure of Yom Kippur is the person who, cl oops, cl who clops their microphone year after year on the same chet, year after year on the same misbehavior. That's, that's, that's very sad. But that's a person who may not have been aware that what Judaism wants is personal transformation, not just seeking forgiveness. We are supposed to transform ourselves. It says in the, in the Jerusalem Talmud, it says, if you come before me for judgment on Rosh Hashanah, and you go away with a good judgment, I, being God, will see you as a new person. And there are many sources which talk about personal renewal as to become a new person, a transformed individual. And that's the vision Judaism holds for us. It's, it's interesting because within that is a sense which Judaism affirms, which many other religious traditions have different views on, is a very strong affirmation that we can change. We can change. Otherwise, tshuva would make no sense. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur would make no sense. Clearly, we must be able to change. Once we accept that, then the path of change becomes crucial to us because that's where we'll get the guidelines for becoming the person that I think most of us want to be and that the Torah says, we have an obligation to be, and that certainly, I think, we have the potential to be. And Judaism is very much about that. So to pull that together, here we stand with a great opportunity. Rabbi Yisrael Salanta, who founded the Muslim movement, he said, many people begin tshuva on Rosh Hashanah. The pious ones begin their tshuva on Rosh Chodesh Elul, at the beginning of the month of Elul. He said, really, when you should begin tshuva is at Ne'ilah. Now, Ne'ilah is the last service of Yom Kippur. Like, that's the very end. Except it's the beginning of the cycle all over again. And that we're now entering a new year. The goal is to enter the new year with some cleansing, which 
to change the metaphor, some of those curtains, some of those obstructions lifted so that the light of holiness shines into our lives and through us into the world. I guarantee that if that happens, if you are a person who moves down that path and becomes more of a beacon of holiness, it, what will be carried along with that is better speech, kinder behavior towards other people, more ethical behavior, less messes in your life, but not because you set the goal at character improvement, but because you set the goal as high as the Jewish tradition sets the goal, which is holiness, and that brings obligation with it. You can't possibly be unethical and holy. You can't be cruel and holy. You can't, it carries it with it and it gives it a motivation. So here we are in the month of Elul, coming up to this opportunity, and what I want to underline is the place I began. It looks like more of an opportunity if you can see yourself as the holy soul that the Jewish tradition sees you as being. The more you can internalize that sensibility of the preciousness of a spiritual being that you are, the more you will weigh with significance this season where our tradition has brought us around again to say, who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? What do you want to bring into the world? What's your steps towards your potential? And that potential is not defined in our tradition in a worldly sense. How are you going to take steps towards becoming the spiritual being you have the potential to be? And the Musr teachers give that a very practical focus. And they bring us a practice called Cheshbon HaNefesh, which means accounting. Cheshbon is an accounting. HaNefesh is of the Nefesh soul. It is to look at yourself and really with, in, the, in the bright light of inner awareness, be truthful as to which inner traits have really announced themselves as being your focus, your growth potential. Also, in the negative way of putting it, these are the obstacles to holiness. So that's the charge I'm bringing to you from the Musser teachers is to look within one of the ways of looking within is looking also without. Look at your behavior. Look at the way other people respond to you. Look at the things that people say. You know, one of the things about having a life partner is very often they are doing a very good job of announcing to you what your spiritual curriculum is. You know, you, you might have thought it was nagging. It's not. It's saying, this is your spiritual curriculum, honey. You know, but the to become aware, again, in the book of Proverbs, it says, the ear that hears the reproof of life abides among the wise. The ear that hears the reproof of life abides among the wise. It is to be aware of where your inner traits are set, especially the ones set towards the extreme, and realize that's the tshuva. That's the return. That's the focus. The behavior follows from that. And so I just want to encourage you and I will leave it at that. And now we can go to some questions. And maybe you want to fill in pieces that, uh, that I might have skipped over. You know, with an 1,100-year-old R&D department, there's a lot. And so uh, I, I pieced this together and hope it has some coherence. But I'm very aware that there may be pieces in there you want to um, have filled in a little bit more. And I'll try. Alan, thank you so much. Thank you. If you, uh, let, we can applaud. It's OK. If you do have a question, I'll just ask you to raise your hand. I'll hand you the microphone so that uh, we can also record the question for those that are watching. Uh, thank you, Alan. I'm just wondering, between the different streams of Judaism, are there different interpretations of Musar? Um, there have been different interpretations of Musar, sort of more historically than between the different uh, traditions of, of, um, of Judaism, you know, it's kind of interesting. I belong to Sheret Tzedek. I'm part of the daily minion in the Orthodox synagogue. I'm also on the expert, what do they call it? Uh, for the Union of Reform Judaism, I can't remember. Expert panel or something. I, I'm very involved with the reform world. And we, we offer programs in, for reform, conservative, reconstructionist, Orthodox synagogues. And 
I once had an interesting um, experience because, as I told you, I, I studied with uh, Rabbi Peir, who was the Rosh Yeshiva of a quite black hat uh, Orthodox Yeshiva, and I was giving a talk at HUC, the uh, Reform uh, Rabbinical College in New York. And there was a guy at the back with a suit and a velvet yarmulke. In his case, it was not a kippah, it was a yarmulke. And I looked at him and I thought, I didn't know who he was. I thought, aha, the yeshiva police. You know, <laughs> the yeshiva police are checking me out when I'm speaking in a reform context because I had been studying very intensely in their context. And he, he's since become a very close friend. Uh, in fact, I spoke to him just last week. And this, I'm talking about 18 years ago. And, and he said, you know, you were, the message you were giving is the same that you would give in our context as well. Because, you know, what the Jewish tradition has to say about the neshama is just about the soul. It's just about the spiritual essence of an individual. There's no such thing as an orthodox soul. And, and even as somebody said, maybe it was Jeff or maybe it was Rabbi Dan at the beginning, that there is a universality to what the Muslim teachings are that goes beyond the Jewish world. You know, it's not just about a Jewish soul. It's about a human soul. But what we learn in Genesis is that you know, humankind was created in the image and likeness of God. Doesn't say Jews are created in the image and likeness of God. And so this understanding of the role of so starting out with the, the view of the human being as spiritually radiant is a beautiful image for me. It's something I aspire to. I don't always get there, as I said, you know, especially driving on the Oak Street Bridge or something or being in Costco. But I aspire to seeing everybody and myself in that way. And, that, and then recognize that that's, that's a universal across all peoples and that ends up being true within the Jewish world. And because that's our focus uh, as the Musser Institute, that's why we, get, we can teach across the board because we're all neshamas. We, uh, I, I've been twice to the California women's prison where there's a Musser group going on. It has been going on for quite some time. And the first time I went there, I was very nervous about, I just didn't know who I'd be meeting. I mean, these are Jewish women in a, in a medium security prison. Who are these people? You know, I, I would have a hard time imagining my sisters, my mother, my daughters, and they, you know, I just, who are these people who are Jewish people end up in prison? And so, you know, I found myself in a struggle between two stereotypes. One is what I've seen in movies and television about women in prison. You know, sort of this image of tough and short hair and piercings and tattoos. And, and then the sisterhood, you know? And I've got this clash of stereotypes going. And then I come and I meet them in the chapel and I look around and it's a diverse group. N no stereotype applies. There's all kinds of people in this group. And then I think to myself, and I really had this thought, I thought, they're neshamas in special circumstances. And then I thought, immediately, I thought, we're all neshamas in special circumstances. That's what a life is. A life is to have a neshama to be a neshama, to have the gift of a spiritual essence, and then you find yourself in your unique context. And no two people are in the same context. Everybody's life is in, so has its own circumstances, and that's what you've been given to work with. But the neshama is here to be on its journey towards holiness, towards the exposure of its holiness. And that again, there's nothing reform in that, or orthodox in that, or Presbyterian in that, or Hindu, you know, it's, it is a Jewish view of humanity and the journey of life for all. You're right. Thank you. Uh, I was going to say, when I pray in the morning, which I do for many people, especially sick people, very sick people, I've got quite a lot in England with cancer, I always pray for their body, spirit, mind, and soul, first. Mm -hmm. And my sister-in-law, actually on Sunday, we speak every week, she's got a son and a daughter got cancer. And she said, what about the healing? And I said, I'll leave that up to God. Uh -huh. But I always find myself praying body, spirit, mind, soul first, and mm -hmm. then asking God to heal whatever the problem is. So it's interesting because, you know, if I, uh, if I pushed you on that, you, because you're using the English word soul, and in the Hebrew, we have three different words, 
one is almost always translated as spirit, but nefesh and neshama, which are two different words with very different concepts, are always translated, both of them are translated as soul. And they're so different. And if you're only operating with a word of such vagueness as soul, then the specificity is missing. So in the healing prayer, we say, refuat ha-nefesh, refuat ha-guf, to heal the, refuat ha heal the nefesh, heal the goof, heal the body. Heal the nefesh soul, heal the body. The implication is that the nefesh soul can get sick. You can have sickness, and in fact, to be, in modern Hebrew, to be holy nefesh is to, to be mentally ill. But, but we say in the liturgy that the neshama is pure. The neshama can't be sick. So there are, you know, the, the neshama is so spiritual that it's only partially attached at the level of this world. And I, I remember once I was teaching a, a class and a, a woman came up to me after and she said that she was, she had terminal cancer. And the explanation of the difference between the neshama and the nefesh, the nefesh being very much of this world. As I said, animals, cows and dogs and crocodiles, they all have a nefesh too. But that the neshama is so spiritual, she said, that helps me understand a struggle I'm going through. Because there's a part of me that wants to stay in this world so desperately. And there's another part of me that's ready to move on. And the nefesh wants to be in this world. The nefesh finds its engagement, its attachment, its identity in this world. But the neshama is not so attached. The neshama is so much more spiritual that, that if there is a sense of an afterlife or uh, a, an eternal life or reincarnation, that's happening at the level of the neshama not at the level of the nefesh. So all these ideas get worked out to, to make it cl clearer that we have a more complex inner world than the word soul would lead us to believe. Because we get a, the notion of soul is almost like a ghost. You know, it's like some, something that possesses us, sort of. But the Jewish view is like very much anatomical and very psychological and very spiritual. And so, I feel like that's where some of the groundwork that make Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur effective needs to happen in our generation, or else we don't, we don't have the, uh, the uh, conceptual basis for really get, taking the most uh, advantage of this opportunity. So I sort of took off from your question, but I felt that, again, reiterating the difference between Nefesh and Neshama, and there are no two English words. There are no two English words. They both are translated as soul. And so it's really um, uh, reductionist uh, on the, uh, of, the, of the subtle and complex uh, nuanced view of our inner life that our ancestors developed when we are uh, const constrained to the English side of the page. Well, someone. Look, we're Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the enlightenment. Um, I'm curious, given your journey, uh, you mentioned that uh, um, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are not about just saying sorry and moving on to the next year, but it's about self elevation. Mm -hmm. um, at what point in your journey have you discovered that? Uh, my journey has really focused very intensely on studying the texts of the Musa tradition. That's been a very, very primary piece of work. Right now I'm involved with uh, a study partner. We're working our way through a book called uh, Or Hatzafun. The, it could mean the northern light or it could mean the hidden light. And it was written by a rabbi in the 19th century, one of the great leaders of the Musa movement in the 19th century. And it's never been translated into English. So we're working our way through it. And that's been where I, that's the well I've gone back to, to draw water from that well. And it's been a very incremental thing. The more I've studied, the more I've understood of this vast, it's quite an amazing thing. It's like a whole Jewish tradition focused on 
in a sense, my inner life and your inner life. It's like, it will help you to understand where anger comes in and what anger is and the positive side of anger and the negative side of anger and how to deal with anger. And, but So it's very, um, you learn more and more all the time. So I consider myself to just continually to be a student of the tradition and recognize how much wisdom uh, has existed in this tradition. You know, I've, I've often said it's a very simple test. So what that it's 1,100 years old? So what? Well, we, Jews are not such stupid people. If people generation after generation after generation found that this wisdom had no bearing on their lives, why did they keep teaching their children? Why did they keep writing more books and keep building on the tradition? It's not like that. It has to be that these previous generations found that there was practical application and deeper understanding about life to the point of actually seeing life quite differently, like the whole basis of a human life so differently. But that comes in time. And I think, you know, one of the things that I, I also feel very strongly is that we are a, uh, a generation of spiritual orphans. Most of us did not get any kind of transmission of Jewish spiritual teaching directly from parents, teachers, rabbis, etc. If we got to a spiritual place in our life of really recognizing the inner life as being our greatest gift and our challenge, and we are here to work with that for the purposes of realizing to some extent the vision of holiness, most of us had to wander, you know, and Today, you can't do a Buddhist meditation retreat that isn't led by someone named Goldstein, Kornfeld, Burstein, Schwartz, Salzburg, Rosenberg, because that's part of where we wandered. But look at the leaders of the yoga world. Look at the leaders of the Sufi world. They're all Jews, because our own pathways were closed to us. The Jewish world was too busy being communal. And so the Jews who were seekers went elsewhere. And our, our generation, I think this generation, sort of the period beginning now, is one of remediating and sort of rebuilding the orphanage, the, the sense of being an orphan. And I think it's very important to recognize, it was certainly true for me, that I had to find my way because there was no direct transmission. I've been in parts of the world where that's not the case, where there's much more continuity. Clearly the Holocaust played a role in that. Clearly immigration played a role in that. Clearly uh, first great opportunity for assimilation played a role in that. You know, we went for assimilation like gangbusters. Why? Because for the last thousand years it wasn't made available to us. And suddenly we could join the club. You know, suddenly we could be part of the mainstream. And, and this generation of which we are part went with that so wholeheartedly that what got cast to the side is the spiritual life of the individual. Well, a Judaism and a synagogue and a community that doesn't have attention to the spiritual life, and the spiritual life is all about the individual, not at the exclusion of the community, but you as an individual within the community, but you as an individual, then that's going to be an unsatisfying tradition that's going to find dwindling numbers, big buildings with no one in it, and people going elsewhere because people have spiritual needs. That's especially true in our generation. Mark. Yeah, um, since a word plays such a big part in your presentation, I'm interested, first of all, in the root of the word Musar. Where does it come from? And uh, secondly, what's the English equivalent? <laughs> since it took you an hour and a half to explain it, is there one word? <laughs> no. It's, I, I like it to, like, uh, you know, what does Kabbalah mean? I mean, you can actually come up with the linguistic definition. It comes from le kabel, it is to receive. But no one actually, you know, when you're talking about it, you don't talk about the tradition of, of, like, good reception or something. That sounds like it's about your television signal or something. Um, the, the tendency is to uh, use the name as a proper name. And that relates, to, so the, the shoresh, the root, is debated, as with many things, but I think the most uh, 
sort of cogent one is limsor, which is to deliver or to hand over, to pass over. So uh, that's from the same root of mem samach resh as musar. So the idea of if, if Kabbalah is receiving, Musar is delivering, you know? It's like, it's what's passed down from one generation to another. Yeah, it's also from the same root, Masoret, you know, it's, it's tradition. So th from the same root, it's what's passed down. So I think that's there too. But probably the most accurate definition in terms of how it's actually been used is, is the word instruction, that Musar is instruction. It shows up in the first verse of the, of the uh, book of Proverbs where, uh, uh, King Solomon says, I've come to give you teachings in Torah and Musar. That's the first verse of the book of Proverbs. So it shows up at Torah and Musar, side by side, which is a very interesting thing. And uh, so clearly there's Torah and there's something which is otherwise. And my last book, which I published in uh, 2014, was... Uh, focused on one section of Pirkei Avot, which talks about the acquisition of Torah. And I think that's the difference. A Torah is a study and a set of guidelines, and Musar is the internalization of the ideals. I think the Jewish world has done a great job of creating ideals. The Musar tradition came to help us internalize them so that we can fulfill that potential. Uh, when I said... Um, earlier in the response, maybe it was to you, Shirley, about no, no difference between the denominations, but in historical eras, Musar has been interpreted differently in different historical eras. And in fact, since the 1830s, 1830s, no generation of Musar teachers has taught the same as the previous generation. They've taught the, the same teachings, but they've taught them differently. And I'll just give you one example, and then I think we wrap up. So my Musar teacher is 80 years old now. And so he, his life spanned sort of the, uh, you know, the, the Second World War period and then into the post-Second World War period. And, th and that's a dividing mark. Before the uh, Second World War, Musar was very centered in Europe, and it was a very harsh discipline. Now, Probably you didn't hear anything harsh in what I taught tonight. But you'll hear in the Orthodox world people saying, someone's telling someone off, and the person says, don't give me your musar. That's what they'll say back to them. Don't give me your musar. Or they're watching a baseball game, and the coach comes out of the, uh, out, out of the uh, dugout and walks out to the pitcher's mount to give the pitcher musar. Like, that's the way it's understood in the Orthodox world. In the pre-war period, and it was quite fierce. Uh, uh, um, a Yiddish novelist, Chaim Grada, wrote a two-volume novel called The Yeshiva. And it's focused on a Musar Yeshiva in the, pre, in the 1930s. And the things that went on there were very harsh. People really beat themselves up. And they didn't stop at beating themselves up. They beat each other up, not physically. But if someone was, you know, I've talked about this sort of extreme of arrogance and you have to pull it back. Well, if they saw someone who was egotistical, they went for them with a ferocity. And, and my Musa teacher knows that, and you can see it in the historical record. In that case, Musa would be defined as reproof or reproach or rebuke. And you'll see that definition, rebuke. The, um, he says, I believe Sometimes, a harsh word to a student, a direct, full frontal verbal attack on that person will cut through their spiritual curriculum and propel them forward like nothing else. He says, I believe that. He said, and I've been teaching for 40 years, and I haven't found quite the right opportunity in which to use that technique. <laughs> and, and he and a number of other Musar teachers of our generation have said, this is a generation that, in which everything needs to be delivered with love. That the pre they, they say the previous generations were tougher. They could take it. This is a generation in which self-love and love of others becomes the basis for working on yourself, doing your spiritual practice, and moving forward. And I think that's a good place to leave it in regard to Rosh Hashanah too because 
if you internalize the notion of being a radiant neshama, you have what to love. There is what to love. Maybe on the nefesh level, you screwed up this way, or you screwed up that way. That should not affect the self-love or the lovability of other people. At the level of nefesh, we got work to do. But at the level of neshama, we're beautiful. And that internalization brought to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur can make a world of difference for yourself, for the people around you, and for this world. And this world needs your holiness. This world needs your holiness. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Alan, thank you. And, and Jeffrey, thank you. And Shirley, and thank you all for coming. Um, I know there might have been one or two more questions, Deborah. I think you had one too. So I'm sure Alan can, can, can uh, you can grab him right after. Um, again, a reminder, Saturday night, the 25th, uh, uh, Chief Justice, retired, not Chief Justice, Supreme Court Justice retired, Marshall Rothstein, uh, will have a dialogue about forgiveness and the law. Join us uh, for that. Join us for other things around the, the shul and the community. Don't forget the Federation opening night, which is coming. Thank you for coming tonight. Eric Tov.